Hello and welcome to Man Enough. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. And I am Jamie Heath. Was that a real pause? Like you it actually was actually because for- I was trying to think of something clever to say about Liz because she looks amazing in this green and just her whole vibe today. Then I forgot my name. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. He even his own children and wife. He says, "I'm sorry. What, what's your name? I you, do. You. Oh. I love you. What's wow. your name? Mm. He's, to my wife. To me all the yeah, time. Yeah. Um. Uh. She's like Emily. Mm-hmm. I do that too. Actually, yeah. I think it's just my brain that's breaking. It makes me feel better. Yeah. That's but me. I've done it since I was a kid, so it's yeah. not an age thing. So yeah, you can. Yeah. Back I off. didn't say that. I was going to transition to why I'm really excited today. Oh my gosh, you are so geeked out. <laughs> you ever see like someone just Aww, really be? And yeah. You don't see Justin. I know. Get I'm nervous. Out. I'm nervous. I don't get starstruck. I don't get starstruck by celebrities mm-hmm. really, yeah. but um, why? Why? Who? Who? So we have John M. Chu on the show today. John M. Chu is the director of In the Heights. He's about to make Wicked. Crazy Rich Asians. Uh, he directed Crazy Rich Asians, a brilliant movie. And uh, I, I just have so much respect for him as a filmmaker. And so, yes, I am a little nervous, mm-hmm. starstruck, geeked out. And and I I know John. We've met before. We we DM and talk. We have mutual friends. But still, it's like I you know selfishly, I'm very excited. So I apologize in advance if I derail the conversation in any way. All right. You looking forward to it, Liz? I am so jazzed. John has been a pioneer in this industry and in Hollywood and film. Um, He's created stories and representation that we've never seen before. And so he's, yeah, a a true Mm -hmm. groundbreaking artist Mm -hmm. that I'm really looking forward to hearing about. Love it. So uh, let's dive in. Let's dive in. Thank you for listening. We will be right back. This is Man Enough. This episode is brought to you by Factor. Hey, everyone. It's a new year, and I am back in action. Mindful, breathful action. But still, just like you, I've got so many things to do. I mean, there's just so much to get done. And I don't want to spend my time in line at the grocery store or hunched over the stove when I could be with my family playing games and making them laugh. You know, all the good stuff. And now that I leave my meals to Factor, I get to spend more time doing those things I want to do. No more meal planning for me. Factor makes it easy for me to eat clean 24-7 with fresh, never frozen, prepared meals that are so delicious, you wouldn't believe they're actually good for you. They deliver chef-crafted meals straight to my doorstep. They save me all kinds of time, and there's no cleanup. What? No cleanup? (laughs) That means no dishes. Now, each Factor meal arrives pre-prepared, and it's ready to eat in two minutes. That's even faster than ordering in. They have registered dietitians and expert chefs who work hand in hand to create meals with nutritious ingredients, something we could all benefit from. And with more than 27 meal options each week, I'm never bored. They offer vegan and veggie meals, cold pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, plant based bars, extra protein, veggie sides, and more to keep me fueled and focused all day long. Head to go.factor75.com slash plans and use code MANENOUGH120 to get $120 off over your first five weeks of meals. That's code MANENOUGH120 at go.factor75.com slash plans for $120 off. Hello and welcome to Man Enough. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. I'm Jamie Heath. And uh, I'm, okay, I'm going to be... I'm going to be honest and vulnerable here. Do it. Uh, I am part nervous, part excited because I have like one of my idols sitting next to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> filmmaker extraordinaire, Mr. John M. Chu. Thank, Thank, Thank you for having being me. here, appreciate man. It, I yes, so sir. appreciate you being here. Ha! Ah, I have so many things. I don't want to like like take the whole conversation over and talk about uh, you know movies and Mm -hmm. being a cinephile but why don't we just start liz the way we normally start which is by telling everybody and telling john all about himself yeah Yeah. (laughs) we're gonna do by the way i i am i'm so honored to be here i think what you guys are doing is like so admirable and what we need Mm -hmm. and meeting the moment and so i know it's not easy uh and we're all in this business together so i'm just Mm -hmm. it's it's really an honor to be here and and hopefully uh, other people who are who are uh, coming up or in the work doing the work right now can, mm. we can share thank you man um, how hard it is <laughs> <laughs> keep going yeah keep going. yes absolutely so, yeah john is a ta- 
talented director uh, and dance enthusiast known for his visually stunning films and kinetic work across genres, most recently including the groundbreaking and hugely popular In the Heights, Crazy Rich Asians, and soon the film adaptation of Wicked, which I am personally very excited about. Um, you were raised in Los Altos, uh, California. You have four siblings. You grew up in a multifaceted cultural background as a first-generation American family uh, with roots in China and in Taiwan. And your wife, Kristen, with, with her, you welcomed your third child. Third. Right? Can you believe yeah. it? Wow. This June. Wow. Um, Three so you- under four. Wow, so you are sleep deprived yeah. right now. Last night I, I, I had like two, longest amount of time to sleep was two hours probably. Oh wow. my gosh, Oof. that's incredible. Yeah. Even more uh, admiration for you being with us here <laughs> today. Thank you so much for being at the Man Enough table. Yes, love it. All right, first question we always ask, my man. Yes. When was the last time that you didn't feel enough? That I didn't feel enough? Yeah, enough. I Every day, every day. Uh, <laughs> I look at my kids and when I have to go upstairs to go on my first Zoom of the day, I feel like, oh, I just want to hang with them. Mm. I feel that uh, here talking with you guys, nervous about what we're going to get into and how am I going to sound and do I sound nasally and am I too close? <laughs> like, it's constant. Um, uh, but I think, uh, I think the hardest time when I don't feel enough is when it is because there is you know there's the when the audience or the people out there think you're not enough and mm-hmm. I've sort of been able to deal with that and we're, I'm sort of built for that I think we all at a certain point get built for that but it's when when I look my wife in her eyes or my kids and I and I can't do that thing that I want to do mm. um, that is the hardest uh, because that's also new for me my whole life you know, as filmmakers, as artists, we're like chasing this thing, this dream that doesn't seem real, but you just keep doing it and suddenly it feels like it might be in your grasp and nothing can get in your way of that. Yeah. Mm. And then you hit whatever age and uh, whether you've made it there or not, and you realize there's so much more to yourself and mm. so much more to life and that uh, and you have a new engine in you and that's, that flip is really hard. You mm. have to, you, you see the whole world differently. Um, mm. You know, I realized that the greatest story, the most important story that I had to tell was to my kids now. Yes. And now what is the story of the world to them? How do I want them to see the light? How do I want them to see the darkness? How do I want them to see the messiness of all of this stuff? And how do I want them to, how, how can I help cope that? Mm. You know, I don't own them. They're not mine. Mm. Uh, we're just preparing them for something that we know is, is can be hard. Yes, man. All right, I'll, I know we have probably a list of questions, but I, because you mentioned your kids, I'm gonna take us off a little bit because mm-hmm. um, I often don't know how the hell to do both. Mm. How do I go and make a movie and leave and, and have the stress and what, you know, what, I, what I have to put on my shoulders, right, as that leader and know that I'm barely gonna talk to my wife and kids for like three months. Mm. I don't know how to do that. Um, and I'm curious if you have found harmony or peace, or if it's something that you struggle with, or it's a suffering that you have, um, mm-hmm. where where are you? Where do you land in all of that? Well, I certainly have not figured it out for sure. Um, but that said, I definitely had uh, a moment of sh- of specific shift. I'm not sure I've told the story, but uh, it's, it's, and it's a little bit of a strange story, but mm. um, we like strange stories. We love it. That's what this podcast is all about. <laughs> you know, I I didn't uh, uh, I didn't smoke pot growing up. I didn't drink. I was pretty I was pretty a rule follower. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't swear uh, any of those things, uh, and um, and so I started. <laughs> I, I had my first uh, sort of marijuana <laughs> smoke out. <laughs> I don't know, five or six years ago. And it was like an extreme because my, my brain had never experienced that. I didn't understand. It was like extreme in terms of opening up these brain waves. I don't know, these p- places in my brain. I grew yeah. up, I'm the youngest of five kids, mm. grew up in a restaurant and a Chinese restaurant. It's still there 51 years later. Wow. And so I, there was constant, people were always living in our house or moving out and moving in, like just. It was a very open house, um, and customers knew our whole stories because my dad would tell stories to, uh, mm. to tell them all our <laughs> lives all the time. And so 
you know, when you're in this business, you're super laser focused. And I went to USC film school doing the thing. And I did my shorts and I was trying to like, and by the way, yeah. Spielberg saw his short. And, yeah. and that's yeah. how he, that's like how yeah. this all yeah. happened. Like yeah. he got an agent because of Spielberg. So no big yeah. deal. <laughs> yeah. 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 Which is a blessing and a curse. We can get into that mm. later. But when I had these experiences, I had these memories that were so visceral of mm. being young, like swimming in the ocean with my family in like Kauai. And, I, and, it, and it was so fulfilling. I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, I could remember the smell of my closet. Mm. I can wow. remember this playing with my toys between the coats of my parents' room. Like, wow the glue that was stuck in the carpet because we would like make arts and crafts. And so there were wow, these details that I journey, never, man. I mean, this mm. was not just once, it was like multiple times. <laughs> I was like, wait, well, I want to know that one again. Love and it. Um, it was just, and, it, and then the flip side to it, it made me really sad. Mm. It made me like realize that life is really temporary. Like mm. I am not that same boy. My family is not that same family. That house is not that same house. It existed. I was there. Yeah. I, it, it affected me and yet I, um, everything had changed since then. And it made wow. me really, really sad. Mm. And then I was looking around me being like, oh, everything is temporary. How sad, like our best days were back then. Yeah. Um, mm. And then one time, maybe I went a little overboard, I spent <laughs> a little too much. And <laughs> I really, I don't know if my parents should listen to this. Um, they, uh, and I had this new vision and I was older and someone was at the door and I opened the door and these two kids come in, they're from college and I, I know them very well. And I'm so excited because we're gonna have dinner together and we have this dinner together oh, um, around this table. And I'm like, these are my kids and I'm so excited. And, and when I came out of that, I was like, oh, our best days are in front of us. Like mm. I want that and I want that now. And this is at a time when I was like, I'm not getting married. I think marriage is dead. Our generation doesn't believe in this thing. And how can you be monogamous? How you can do all these things? And at that moment, I was like, I want that as fast as possible. Mm. And I and um, mm. and I, mm. I was I was uh, in a very serious relationship with with my who's now my wife, and we were like, Yeah, that's what we want. And let's 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 not waste time. And so we uh, we you know we had three babies in four years but but i think for yeah. me <laughs> and you have you not got right to it. time <laughs> but it was a it was a perspective shift yeah and i we put mm. this in the movie in in the heights actually like that the, this mm. idea that um you know he says my, those were my best days of my life yeah. and then in the end uh spoiler alert he's talking to he's telling the story to his daughter yeah, and he's I saying love that so much mm. this is the best these are the best days and they're ahead of us like how great mm. and now it's yours now take it and run mm. got the chills me to me that was everything i do now is focused around this is it yeah this is the memories that they're gonna have i'm reliving all the those all those memories i had in, in, in my high times um <laughs> the closet the toys the going to disneyland going to our trips like we're, we're living that now it doesn't make it um a balance anymore it makes it like a part of yeah that same thing that itches when i make a movie so you've stopped looking for balance and you've been more about this is it. I'm about uh, including yeah. it in that, but it's been uh, amazing too. When I when you when I've been changing that perspective of yeah. it, it makes it again. It's not solved, yeah, mm -hmm. but it makes it more like work and my family are a part of the same thing that that f fulfills mm. me. Mm -hmm. And if I can include, you know, my daughter Willow to come to see a dance rehearsal, mm. and she like knows all the words to all the wicked songs. <laughs> Uh, and we get to talk about what does popular mean? And like, oh, well, popular can be, you know, a silly thing or it can be like a very powerful thing mm -hmm. or it can be something that you think is important but really isn't. Or what does defying gravity mean? Like we get into these conversations and and suddenly it all connects. And, I, and it also now forces my work. Of, I'm now jealous of Willow, by the way, because I want to talk to you about all of those songs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. we have. We, she knows all the words. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Yes. So here you are, this um, super successful man. Um, brilliant and doing something that many people don't get to do. Mm -hmm. um, you're also Asian. Um, very few people are seen and recognized in this industry, in the world, to do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curi curious, you're on a podcast called Man Enough. right? Mm -hmm. So obviously all those things and the accolades and who you are, we don't really care about here. Mm -hmm. We care about in the world, but in the real sense, we don't really care about that. I care yeah. about more like, who are you 
and, and how does that relate to your experience in life with what you do? How do you walk as a man dealing with the wonderful things about masculinity and also the toxic stuff that gets us, mm -hmm. how it affects women? How do you feel your walk of life and your experience? What do you have to offer mm -hmm. to the humanity mm -hmm. in that regard? Well, one, uh, thank you for saying all those kind things, but I truly know that I am literally not any more special than anyone else. I am not, like, I do believe there might be some geniuses out there. I take that, and I think there are some very uh, skilled people out there, but the, I am not one of them at all, 100%. I can tell you straight up, I have no skill set. I, um, in terms of like, a craft of some sort. I am, I'm a curious person and I do what I say and I say what I do. So it's, it's mm -hmm. actually very simple, but, and I will work my butt off be, and not just because to achieve something, but because I'm actually really curious about mm. it because I come, I, I know I don't know everything. Um, and I'm, and I grew up in a, like I said, in an environment of a Chinese restaurant, immigrant uh, parents who came here when they were 19, 20 years old. Uh, and the roles of parents maybe in my family were different than maybe the other regular American mm -hmm. families that were around us. I saw my um, friends' parents being very loving to each other. My parents were not like lovey-dovey to each other. I saw them, you know, have breakfast with uh, uh, cinnamon rolls in the morning that their mom cooked, and I did not have that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sometimes we'd have pot stickers. Uh, and uh, so very early, I learned that we were, uh, our family was different. Um, and my dad was always working in the, in, in the restaurant. If I mm. wanted to see my dad, we would have to go to the restaurant. And so we spent a good time there. And I think I watched my parents, despite all the, you know, regular vocabulary of love, show love in action and watching my dad design a catering platter on a napkin and showing us and being excited about what he was going to cook for that. That's beautiful. And image. then working in the back, deboning chicken, and then working in the front, cleaning up, and then talking to, you know, a customer from the Silicon Valley about their business and their family and being a part of their family because he's filling their bellies and their hearts there. Mm -hmm. And then watching my mom have to, you know, go to parent meetings and fit in with a group that she did not fit in with. And in fact, not just fit in, but also like uh, elbow room for herself. Mm. And at the same time, when you're when they're both in the restaurant, a customer feels like they're king and can cut them in two seconds and treat them like the help. Mm. And I'm watching all of this and they don't give them the satisfaction of falling into uh, a reaction and instead return love, mm -hmm. that was very hard to watch as a young person. Mm -hmm. And yet when I would get frustrated, they would sit me down and, and tell me, you know, this restaurant was built in 1969. There, are, there were not a lot of Chinese people here, especially interfacing with the other people here, the Caucasian people or the people who went to Stanford here at, this, at that time. And so we are ambassadors. Mm -hmm. and, we, and if they come in here with certain things, ideas of who we are and where we are in their brain, they have to leave here questioning those ideas. They have to leave here when they see another Chinese family mm. and not jump to those conclusions. And that was a responsibility for us that was laid very uh, deeply early in our lives. Uh, my oldest brother, uh, he was like the, the tall, good looking one of our family. Uh, he's like 6'2", played all the sports. Like he became, my mom, and him conspired for him to be the ASB president, to be the <laughs> captain of the tennis team and the soccer team and the basketball team. His name is on the banners. And so for me, you know, if my dad wasn't there, my older brother was there as a inspiration that, oh yeah, I can be ASB president. I can be popular. I can be cool. Mm. I wasn't the cool kid, but if he could be cool, then I was accessible. So I lived in this world that probably didn't exist for all Asian American kids at that moment. Yeah. Um, and so that was really for me as a man. And what does even being a man mean nowadays? I don't, I'm not, I'm, I think we're all trying to figure that for, out. That's yeah. why this is such, such a great place. But, you know, taking care of, of your loved ones, of your family, of your friends, um, 
knowing the having that confidence that you can do what whatever you want to do these were all taught by the things that are around me i also have a brother who has learning disabilities mm -hmm. special needs and so mm. My whole family had to learn sign language. I didn't because by the time I came around, he started to talk and he, he's, he, now, he, he, now he talks all the time. He calls me every day uh, <laughs> and he loved movies. And so there's also an idea of you're not better than anyone else because we would go into a restaurant and people would stare, which is fine, but they would judge immediately. I mean, there's five kids running around and they're staring at us like, what are we doing here at whatever, the mm -hmm. opera or my parents would take me to. And if my brother decided to have a tantrum and not want to go on a trip that we were packed and ready to go and at the airport for, we would just leave. And we had no room to complain. We had no room to say, no, this isn't fair. Like we would just go. Mm. And so I think we got used to, and my, my mom and my dad made it very clear that that's the, that this is, this is our family. Mm. And I think um, that kind of being able to accept things that on, on, on at the turn mm. of a dime, I think was like, mm. was built into us as well. Flexibility. So, and okay. when, when you look at a family, how do you judge them? And wh what's going on in that family that you don't know? So mm. we have all these complex ideas of mm. family and what it means to be a part of a family that I think is embedded in me and how I've navigated mm. it, I guess. I love it. Sorry. I love that hearing all long, that about you. And, and, that, no, no, it wasn't a long answer. Actually, it no. explains a lot about who you are mm. and why. So then, sorry, guys, let me just ask one other thing since you just said that. So how do you take, because what you just, the picture you just painted for us about your life, um, I resonate with a lot of it. I also have a brother who has Down syndrome, so special needs, and and all what you had said about uh, just how that you navigated life and what you learned. I too have had that experience. Probably not as good as you, but um, um, because you seem like a a man that really has your stuff together. Um, so how do you take all that and what you just explained? And for instance, on your movie sets, in your home, um, someone like Liz who are, as we're speaking, I'm also thinking, I, my question to you once to, is gonna be, what do you do in your life that makes the world safer for Liz on your movie sets for women? Also to like, you know, get rid of some of the toxic stuff. But as I'm asking you that, I'm realizing that since we've started this podcast, I haven't made any space for Liz to talk. So that's one way that I know <laughs> I can be better for the next one. So I am curious what you, with your experience, then what do you do daily or weekly to make it look different? Uh, I'm, I'm definitely not immune to the usual uh, trappings of <laughs> what we've been taught and what, we're, what our normal patterns are. But, uh, but I think the main thing for me is that we are, and it sounds cliche, but we're all human beings. And life is so hard. Life is so hard. We're all going through so much shit. Mm. And, uh, and there's no... <laughs> There's no magic solution for that. Right. Uh, just that we have each other to get through that. Mm. Again, that sounds so cliche, but it. I, I deeply, deeply believe that everybody has their own currency of what they're, why they're living right now. Mm. Mm. And, you know, if you have a actor that is acting poorly on set, like there is a reason, and my job as the director is to access that reason. Yeah. And if it's because they need to be in that mode for their, for their role, then I need to give the space and make sure that's communicated to everyone around them so that right. it's not about, it's about understanding this person. And so anyway, I, I don't, again, I don't, that's not the best answer, but I, I don't, I don't, I think that's the thing that I always keep in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully that, 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 that helps yeah. and, uh, and, tr and try to work with people, a no assholes for sure. <laughs> and two, work with people who are, are, are all contributing mm -hmm. to the story. It's not me saying, this is the story. Everyone fill in the colors. It's mm -hmm. like, hey, here's what we're trying to say. Here are the things I know. What can you do to help tell this story with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the no yeah. assholes policy is uh, Olivia Wilde coined that term on her set talking about Shia LaBeouf. And mm -hmm. I think this idea, which which I really resonate to as, as a woman, that we've kind of accepted a culture that we think is normal. We don't call it masculine. We just call it normal that people were kind of like dicks to each other on Hollywood sets. <laughs> but it was actually, yeah, it was like a male, um, I mean, stereotypically male culture. So um, mm -hmm. I love no assholes. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually really moved uh, listening to you talk about your family because I really relate with so much of 
the messages that 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 or sort of the the values that your family mm -hmm. uh, passed on um, and and that you are also passing on in, in your work. And I'm was moved why, when you answered the question about your children, you know, and you said, you know, what is the story of the world that I'm telling them? And that's really what you do, right? You're this mm -hmm. insanely successful um, Hollywood director who gets to really tell stories. And um, and when it relates to Asian masculinity particularly, right, um, there is a long history of Hollywood telling horrible stories yeah. about Asian men uh, and Asian people in general. But I think Asian masculinity particularly, there's the, if people aren't aware, it's, it's the Yellow Peril mm -hmm. era, right, where um, a lot of the movies that were coming out were featuring, you know, Asian men were seen as uh, a danger, particularly to white men and the jobs that they wanted and the jobs that they had. Uh, and then, yeah, in the late 1800s, the Chinese exclusion era we can talk mm -hmm. about all, the, all those policies but how it you know really came through is, is 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 through the stories that we told and so racism is created through stories um because race doesn't exist so it's literally story through storytelling that mm -hmm. we create these um these ideas so it can also be the way that we eradicate it right stories yeah. can then be the way that we change it but then that creates so much responsibility on the very people who are yeah. hurt by those stories to then change that narrative and so how do you navigate that, mm -hmm. right? Feeling the sense of responsibility and then also being like, but I just want to tell stories about everybody or I want to tell stories about a bunch of stuff. I don't want this pressure. Yeah. Uh, I think the only way out is through. I think that mm -hmm. artists of every generation have been asked to meet their moment of the moment that they're living in. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have asked to be in this position since we were kids to chase this dream. Mm -hmm. And maybe we didn't realize that also <laughs> there's a responsibility to be have the microphone. I, for ten, for seven movies, wanted to deny that I had a responsibility to other people other than entertainment. The whole time I'm like, no, I want to be, I don't want to be seen as an Asian American director. I just want to be seen as a director and I can do whatever I want. And that, that's a fair thing to say. I will never tell an artist to do something. They have to do something. That's like the literal opposite of art. But I also had to grow as a person and I remember uh, realizing, well, one, hearing the voices of everyone on the outside of our business, Oscar So White, um, starring John Cho, which was this hashtag started by William Yu on, on Twitter that I saw that he just put uh, John Cho in the, on the posters of big movies that were starring white men. <laughs> and it made, and uh, you look at them and it seems like so simple and silly, but when you look at them, it broke my brain. I was like, yeah, actually he should be that. Why isn't he? And then it made me question all the things I've heard in my meetings of like, oh, you know, this, these people can't sell internationally. Oh, that, right. you can't have that love story. You can only sell in America. I was like taught in these ways. Mm. Yes. And I believed in these ways because I was working in the industry. Yes. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, people don't understand because they're not putting the money in. And so I'm in the business. I know that there are other things that people aren't considering, blah, 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 blah. So you internalized all of that. Oh, I didn't just yeah. internalize it. I like put it on like, yeah. uh, you know, I carved it in mm. as like the way mm. the world, the way this business works. Wow. But when I got to read and understand what everyone was saying more, and then I would look at my meetings that I'm going in and I'm like, yeah, I'm in a position where I can, I can literally, I've made enough money for these studios that I can go make whatever movie I want right now. Maybe I get one, maybe two shots at doing that mm. and I can cast whoever. So if I were to do that, what would I do? Um, and, uh, hmm. and that shook me. And, uh, and so I was, yeah. So I dropped everything that I was doing and I cleared my slate. I went on a search for something very personal. Cut back to, by the way, 10, 12 years prior to this moment. Uh, I had made a short film at USC called Guaylo, which was, was called White Devil, basically, which is what they called me when I went to Hong Kong when I was, you know, 16 years old. Mm. And it was about Asian American kid who goes through their mm. cultural identity crisis. And we screened it and it got, you know, a, a big reception. But I was so self-conscious of it. Like I didn't get it right. Like I didn't know. People wow. would question me in my class. Like people don't say that stuff to you. And I'm like, wow. I'm like oh, that seems kind of like victimizing or like you're, mm. you're playing the victim. And I'm like, yeah, I guess it is. It feels very weak to say this stuff. So I, I pulled wow. back. Jesus. I never submitted it to film festivals. I never uh, put it into a lot of content. I like, it just went dead. I was like, I just need to make the next thing. Oh. And so, and that was like a musical thing and all this. And it was a reaction to another student film that I saw right before uh, at, in school where 
it was a comedy, dating comedy, and the butt of the whole joke, of the whole short, at the end, she everyone's coming through the door and she's meeting all these guys. The last one, she opens the door as an Asian guy. And she just says, uh, no. And she closes the door and the whole crowd laughs. And I didn't understand the joke. I was like, what's funny about that? And that like threw me, which is why I made Guaylo to like be the opposite of that. And then I do it and I got- You're shamed. I'm shamed. Like I don't feel confident to even say these things. And plus, by the way, the Asian people in my class are like, you're not Asian enough to even say this shit. Like (laughs) you're the the whitest Asian I know. You know, there's like all this stuff. So then I don't know. So then I make a musical. Uh, so you have no identity at that I'm point. I mean, uh, nobody will accept yeah. my voice in any of those. Wow. So I make a musical about mothers, and that is what Spielberg saw. That is what gets me. So I'm in a way um, rewarded. Nothing, I'm rewarded. I won the lottery, rewarded for wow. my decision that I switched on it. Mm-hmm. So for all those years, I'm thinking this is the way of the world. Stop trying to make it something else. And then I'm woken up by Twitter to say, what are you, who, what are you listening to? Who, what is, wake up. And that's when I went on searching for, I almost went back to film school in my head of like, what do I want to make that speaks to this? And I, we, and I found this book, Crazy Rich Asians, which wasn't my story, but the, an Asian American going to Asia for the first time was my story. Yeah, I couldn't speak to the female part of that, but I could speak to the what that feels like to be of different worlds and then also come to some sort of negotiation amongst yourself of embracing both and making mm. your own rules for that, but also respecting both sides of that, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And that's where Crazy Rich Asians came in. And I got to gather these actors like Gemma Chan and Jimmy O. Yang and Constance Wu and uh, all these people, uh, Nico Santos, who were already working. They just weren't in the spotlight yet, mm. but they were the best of the best. When the when you're first at the well, you get the best. <laughs> and so I got to pull them all together and it was an amazing experience to be in Asia. We were in Malaysia and Singapore shooting and we had Asian food every day and we didn't have to explain why. Mm. Uh, we could go out and have like, the, the spices, the things that we talk about family, talk about our experiences. And it's all these people from all different parts, not just American, mm-hmm. Asian Americans. Uh, they're from the UK, from Singapore. I mean, uh, and even, uh, and, and Henry, Henry Golding, who was just his first movie. Um, he was from Malaysia uh, and, and the UK mm. and, and Singapore. And Michelle Yeoh, she had never experienced what it feels like to be a minority in her industry. So we got to share this around a table. And how empowering is that? And every day we'd come on the set, we knew there was magic happening. We didn't know that other people would get it. And so when other people now are experiencing that through that movie, it was, um, I feel very uh, lucky to, to, to have experienced that, you know, maybe like a year prior mm. with this group. And so everything whatever we're all going through now, I feel like everyone is catching up to the, re- or waking up. Mm to where we should be headed. And mm. and what did you learn mm. from that, right? Of being in this environment where you internalized all of these ideas that weren't true about you and, and about, mm. you know, the world and, and, and other people. Have you, do you have like tricks? Cause this happens <laughs> to me all the time <laughs> as a woman. Uh, and, and I'm sure to, you know, many people who are listening, you know, how did you, yeah sort of move from that into a place of knowing who you are and knowing what you're making and not sort of tuning those voices out. I I love being the underdog. I love it when someone Mm. says, you can't do that. In fact, it's probably my crutch. Yeah, I I feel that. If I have a nice story idea and it's crazy and someone says, oh no, you'll never make that. I literally like, watch, sit back, (laughs) watch. There's nothing better for me. And maybe that's an ego thing. I don't know. I just love when someone says you can't Mm -hmm. because then it's game time. Yeah. Yes. So I think maybe that's a survival mechanism. I have to adopt. That's a trauma response. Yeah. It could be. Yeah. I, uh, I couldn't relate to that more. By the way, that response is also praised by America. Yeah. Oh, your ankle's broken. Keep playing. Oh, (laughs) you're sad because you're, dad died mm-hmm. go on the show and mm-hmm. do it live yeah. let us all watch you conquer. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Like, what overcome the it fuck? Mm-hmm. yeah yeah bootstraps and that and we are proud of that we wear it yeah. like a medal and and i maybe the other next generation won't have that but it's still in me like mm-hmm. of course mm-hmm. yeah i just as you were talking about the i don't know little john 
um, what you were experiencing in college, man. Like I wanted to cry for you as you were just, I just imagine watching that last guy be Asian and the door slam. What is that? And I'm curious, you know, the stereotypes that go along with being an Asian man, right? When she, when you, when you watch and everybody in the auditorium laughs, did you have a lot of experiences like that growing up? What was that like for you as a man, specifically an Asian man, with how all of these things are perpetuated? Why wouldn't why yeah. this white girl wouldn't want to date you? Now you're married to a white woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like for your confidence growing up? What was that like in dating? Like, well, how did I, that interfere? What I can see looking back is I had to separate myself from the person on that screen. Mm. I'd be like, oh, I'm not that. Right. That's how you mm. get past that. Like. Oh, I'm a different version of that. I'm like, I'm like you guys, right? Like, oh, you're making fun of them. Yeah, they, that is funny. Ha ha ha! I'm laughing with you. Japanese, mm. Chinese, dirty knees. Look at the. Yeah, yeah, that is funny. Like, I had to go along. Mm. That's what's so um, sinister about it all Fuck. is that I don't even comprehend that I'm doing it to myself. Yes, I'm going along because I want to stay in the room and I don't want them to think that I think like that person, I'm not a foreigner, I'm you guys. Mm -hmm. So we should make fun of this together, yeah. And then those students who are coming overseas here are then looking at me like, you motherfucker. And mm. I'm looking at them like, don't fuck this up for me. <laughs> if you're coming wow. into my fraternity, mm -hmm. I just laid the groundwork to make it all cool and you're gonna come in here, don't. And I think that's what's like the biggest shift of all of this is breaking down that prison and now when i'm on set if i see another asian dude asian woman anybody i'm like i got you yes i can go i like i see you and i got you you do your thing and it's like the most fulfilling thing to know to just be aware of that that somebody's feeling out of it mm. being surrounded in the set maybe they're a pa maybe they're in costume maybe wherever so anyway that that's been a process of deprogramming and, yeah. and, and then um, owning where you are now and really feeling confident and yeah. to be in that. I have those same experience. When I was a kid, I used to tell everybody, so my mom's white, yeah. um, because I did not want to be the person on the screen. Mm. Um, I walked into every situation. I mean, one of the first things that someone w would have known about me was that my mom's white. Hey guys, how you going? Oh, I, I love that keyboard you got over there. Hey, you know my mom's white. Mm. Oh, you guys like disco music? Oh, no, forget all that stuff, man. Oh, you like, you like Group Rush? You like Journey? I like Journey. Mm. I had to let them know that I was not black or not the black version mm. of what they thought black was. Um, their experience, their whole... So I knew that for a long time, even though I was black and, and um, owned it in so many ways, I couldn't display that out. And then I had to let the rest of the world know that I just fit in. Mm. But that also came as a pr at a price, because as I started getting older, um, I started realizing that I had opportunities to speak up and to stand for people in a way that no one else could, mm. because I had unique experience to a white culture, but I also had a voice and looked a certain way and was having success, and I could do so much to change something. I mm. couldn't just be fit in. So what I love, what I hear about what you're doing and your recognition is I don't know if this is offensive or not, but I'll just say it. I don't just see you as a director. You're brilliant. I see you as a fucking brilliant Asian director. Because the truth is, Justin is brilliant, but the odds are not against him. He still had to do it. He wasn't handed a ticket. No offense. None taken. But, but that's not afforded you. You got everything going against you growing up. I've read some stories about when you was a kid and how you talked about, you know, hiding your dumplings and things like that. Like, like like the fact that you had to armor yourself with all this protection so that you could survive. Um, so much to say that I don't want to be seen as an Asian director because that makes sense. But the fact that now you've come around like to embrace that, it doesn't belittle you in the world. Mm -hmm. Everyone else, right, still sees you as brilliant. Yeah. But now all of the people that have, are also against that grain get to feel empowered as well and feel that it's possible yeah. and feel that you see them you just said on the set. Um, mm -hmm. So I love that. I love hearing you say that and, and talk about where you're at. And mm -hmm. now we have to do it also um, for women as well. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Because we see, I look around all our sets and all of our stuff and women are still in subordinate roles generally. Um, it's still um, generally white 
which actually I do want to ask you a question later on, but I'm not going to dominate no more, but it does bring me, but I'm really proud of what I hear you saying and where you are and what you've become, you know, as a, um, and how humble you are. You just said, by the way, earlier you had said, I'm no better than anybody else. I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, you didn't say you didn't know what you're doing, but you said something of that nature, you know, I'm just figuring it out. And yet you still have a lot of confidence. I love that. He said, he said he wasn't, he wasn't a genius. I would argue. Yeah, we all argue Especially that. because I think your curiosity is your genius. and One of the things and, for sure. Yeah. I uh, Love thank that. You. I feel like we could, there's so much to talk about. I, um, I'm, you said you weren't, you said you weren't popular in high school. I mean, no, I was. You were. <laughs> Come uh, on. Because uh, we, we were in a very small school. And, yeah. you know, when you, you grew up near Palo Alto, brothers, right? Yeah, in Los Altos. And when you have all your brothers and sisters who went to that school. Yeah. The teachers know you, the people know you, your brother's like the cool dude, like you're pretty upset. Yeah. So I wouldn't say I was like, but you seem like, because cool dude, what, when was... you described your family, the picture I saw was this unique, all of these unique experiences that build, I think to me, empathy. Character. Mm. Like I saw like, wow, this family environment really created this kid and a family that, um, was able to really like create empathy. And I think that's the key to being a storyteller. I think that's one of the reasons why maybe I love your movie so much. Mm. It's because even when you're making these visual spectacles, my criticism of Hollywood has always been like, you tend to have filmmakers who go do one or the other. Um, you can do the visual spectacle and you can do the heart. And you've always done both, which is why I'm like, damn, this dude, like, that's what I want to be. And it seems like so much of your life, your family experience, having your brother with special needs, like mm -hmm. watching your parents be in some ways berated or abused by these people and then showing love and kindness. Like that's how you build empathy and create empathy. And then that's what you're putting in your movies. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But how do you, how do you stay out of the Hollywood popularity game? The um, patriarchal like boys club, if you will, that our business also honestly is mm -hmm. um especially when when so much of your early career was rewarded for like doing the opposite of what your heart really wanted you to do right yeah you steven spielberg saw your movie that you only made because you were embarrassed of your other movie mm -hmm. um which by the way i hope you show that movie sometime i hope that i want to see that <laughs> i want to see online that online or anywhere yeah but yeah but maybe one day you will but sure. i would love to at least even if it's a private screening yeah uh, i'd love to see it but I love watching like, it now, by the way. I look at it and I feel for that kid who made that. Mm. That was out of like mm. grabbing at something that I didn't yeah. quite understand yet. It was a musical with like a barbershop quartet with like this Americana music on top of this very Asian American story. And it was, uh, so the mix of it is actually really interesting to look at now. It also sounds like there's a just knowing crazy rich asians and what you did musically there's like a little bit of that in there. oh yeah it seems like that was like kind of like inspired that because you did a little bit of that but how do you yeah. so so with, with just knowing hollywood and like w how you get ahead in hollywood and how you're rewarded in hollywood like how yeah. have you been able to stay grounded in success in a place that really generally rewards power and dominance and white men um I think because yeah. I never had the ability to be in part any be in any of those clubs, <laughs> like my only way forward was the work. Yeah, in 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 all things, even even in high school, even though like I wasn't, uh, I would say I was popular in that I wasn't hated. Yeah, and but I wasn't like the person that everyone wanted to necessarily like be friends with because I was popular or something like that. It was just it was always like I was the video guy. Yeah. Oh, you bring the video guy. Then you get a video and that was you get your pictures. That was your value. Yeah. So you're That's in. Right. So I use the camera as a way to talk to anybody. Even when I didn't have a camera, I made like a fake camera out of like Kleenex. This is like in fourth grade with a Kleenex box and thing. And I would go interview people at lunchtime because then I could like sit with people and anybody, any of the girls, the boys, like they, they were down talk to talk to, to me. Yeah. And they thought it was funny. And so all the events I would go to with my camera. And so I think uh that that was embedded in me that, oh, it's, you just got to do your thing. Um, I think that was also taught by my family that it's the work. My, my mom, the night that she knew I was very serious about movie making, I was, it was like three in the morning and she came in and I was editing something and she pulled the plug on my computer. She thought like, why are you spending time on this? Oh. I convinced my teachers to let me make videos instead of write papers. 
No and way. I, and I told her, thing? and I, and I, yeah, <laughs> you know, we were, we were smart back then. And, <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, so I cried about it that night. And then I went to her room. I said, you told me to chase something. And this is what I want. This is not a hobby. The next day she came with a pile of filmmaking books and she said, oh. if you're going to do this, you got to study it like a real, uh, real thing. And from then on, they had my back. I mean, they had my back that, mm. at at the screening of my short film. They were like, what do people eat? My whole family came, by the way, in this like big van, <laughs> my brothers and sisters. And they're like, what are you feeding the people who are coming to see your, your short? I was like, nothing. I got like <laughs> <No> chips. <money. laughs> and they're like, no, 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 no. So they went to Costco, bought all this stuff, cooking in my apartment what? kitchen. And they brought it all there. And they served everybody. My whole family served like 300 people. At USC? At USC. Wine and d desserts and like things. Like <laughs> uh, they were working. That's what you come with. And uh, I think that always. And you know, you saying that I didn't have, we didn't, we, we didn't always have the privilege of stuff. I think what the secret is, is that I actually had the greatest privilege that you could ask for. Maybe not connections. Maybe had no idea how this business worked. But my dad and my mom sat me down and said, you make the right choices. Because you have th two things that nobody on this planet get, as and, and you know you have as a guarantee. We have a restaurant, so you'll never go hungry. You'll never go hungry. Mm. And we have a house. means you'll never be homeless. Wow. You better make right decisions. Don't there make desperate decisions. And not, I understand that is a privilege. Say that again. And people Say cannot that make again. that, have that, but that was. Right they decisions. Took, they literally the right took decisions. away the scarcity mentality from you. So that yeah. you could make decisions from a place of abundance. Yeah. When when they told you that, that's amazing. It's great, and that's how you do end up making right decisions when you're operating and, out of. And that. that stays with you. Yeah, my my I didn't make a movie, even though I got discovered by Steven Spielberg. I didn't make my first movie till five years later, and at mm -hmm. that point, I thought the moment had passed. And my manager at the time, I was like, I need something. Send me anything, and they sent me uh, this uh, sequel to a direct to DVD sequel to a dance movie called Step Up. And I was like, oh, yeah, I don't do direct-to-DVD movies. I got discovered by Spielberg. And my mom was like, when did you, what are you talking about? When did you become a snob? Like, you haven't done anything. And a storyteller, it doesn't matter what medium. You should be able to tell a story around a campfire. You should be able to tell a story yeah. in a commercial. You should be able to tell, a, a, you know, an after-school special movie if you can really do this. And uh, that also... And then wow. and it reminded me, whatever choice you make, it doesn't matter if they pigeonhole you. It doesn't matter. Again, mm -hmm. you're gonna have food and you're gonna house. Like, do Who cares? Be, mm -hmm. get, just get better at it. So let me add one yeah. more to that. Then you have a food and your house. And if your act, your directing career for somehow doesn't work out, you got a job at Wayfair. Too, yeah, because <laughs> <the> way. <Yeah. laughs> your thinking is wonderful. I love it. <laughs> well, my 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 voice becomes less nasally. <laughs> you know, like and let's talk about how you deal with criticism and, and feedback, right? So yeah. In the Heights was Im immensely uh, successful and popular. It also got criticisms, um, particularly mm. from the black community. Um, how did you how did you deal with that criticism? Uh, I know how it feels to feel yeah. unseen. And so mm. when you hear when someone's speaking out about that, you shut the hell up and you listen. Like that's I love that. Isn't that like we're all on the same side? I love people try to like make it like we're fighting against mm -hmm. each other because that benefits the bigger idea of just not having to deal with all this stuff. Yeah. But as storytellers, that it's hard being storytellers on the front line. We've got to start somewhere and we've got to learn things and we've got to also celebrate the victories of what we have. And so it was um, it was hard, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. to hear that about something you put so much love and care and you thought about every detail every day and made room for it every day and got a summer release because you believed that this community deserved a space like that. You deserve, you, 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 you got Warner Brothers to put tens of millions of dollars you to fought. make these movie stars people who are not movie stars beforehand and people who are traditionally not looked at as movie stars to make the story of a bodega owner mm -hmm. the star of this movie, to take a whole community who we grew very close to, so close that I named my son Heights, that yeah. everyone on the block we knew, mm -hmm. that we didn't even have catering. 
We gave the people cash to go spend it in the community to yes. eat. That we were all together all the time. That we talked about the food every day. Yeah. That when we had the, you know, in that opening eight minute number, when we have a Dominican uh, family eating uh, breakfast, that we have the breakfast that they have, that they were like, you, you've never seen this on film before. You better get a close up of that. And I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, let's get <laughs> it. I, I have to be able to celebrate what we did. This was, you know, 4.6% of characters in movies with dialogue are. Latinx or Latino or Latino. So we made a movie 99.9% .9 of that with all shades of color and all shapes and sizes and all ages. And when, and we painted every Latin American country in the flags digitally or physically, we didn't have all the flags on the day. So we digitally painted every flag in, 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 in a scene so that everyone mm -hmm. we knew could have a moment. That's a lot of country, by the way, uh, or a lot of yeah. places. Yeah. And, uh, but again, we have, it just it makes the case that we need to keep making more because we're not going to solve all of this stuff without continuing to make stuff and then kicking the tires on what we just did and say how can we do it better how can we do it better mm -hmm. you know we make art to cause discussion and i think that that's we have to remember that that comes with it mm -hmm. that we're going through this together but at least we all get to make the decisions this is a movie a musical that People are dancing on the side of a building. An African-American man and an Afro-Latino woman are on the side, like Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire. One of my that favorite scenes. That has never scenes. been in a Hollywood movie before. A Hollywood movie has never had a movie like, it's a radical idea in the Heights. And the style of dance is not, it's not some foreign movement for them. This is of the street style. It's salsa or light feet or b-boying. These are also my friends, my very close friends. So it's like, we got to use the language and put it in there. And again, mm -hmm. also when we were making it, I was working with Lynn, Manuel Miranda and Kiara, um, who, and, and all the actors who had an active participation in every scene, because I don't understand it. I'm not from Washington mm -hmm. Heights. And so that, that mix was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And we have to mm -hmm. celebrate that. Everyone's so proud every day on that, mm -hmm. that set. Mm -hmm. No violence, no villain, no gun, no drugs, there's literally, it's about rooting for the guy on the, in the bodega to get his dream. I appreciate what you said about this idea yeah. of, no, we still could, we had to celebrate it. Because yeah. I have a tendency, I have a tendency to go too far in one direction because of, I think, my upbringing and not being popular and, and having, you know, wanting so much to be approved, uh, to be liked and approved of, and then, you know, saying the wrong thing. And then they, I didn't have friends anymore. Um, and, and I'm just curious how you personally handled that. Like I got the response, like, yeah, you know, yeah. you and Lynn, but I know as a filmmaker, um, I remember when I made five feet apart, it was my first movie. I put my soul into it. It was based on a real person, a friend that I loved who died just before I could show her the movie of, um, mm -hmm. a lung transplant, which the character at the end of the movie got and lived through. And then a, I remember a, a group of the P the CF community were so mad at the movie. They thought I was romanticizing the illness and they started attacking me. And I remember f shutting down and feeling like, oh my God, I did a bad thing. Like, and I had a really hard time. That was my first experience, like pouring years into something, being so proud of it, releasing it and having like seven people decide <laughs> that the thing I did was no longer a value yeah. or that I was a bad person or I missed it. And that's what we can do in our culture is like, we can forget about the whole painting. We can focus on the thing. And I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to rectify those feelings. Um, and I'm just curious how you, what advice you have to anybody? Cause I think this is important in all aspects of life. Like I, I know I saw the detail of that movie. I know the stories of, making sure the food was representative. I know mm -hmm. all the stuff. And then of course there was a, there was a, there was a, there, something was missed. A community felt underrepresented. What did you do in that moment? I had to like understand a, so I talked to a lot of people trying to get a sense of like, what did, where, where, how did we, and, and what I came to realize is the worst thing you can come to the conclusion of is that, ah, oh, you can't do anything right. Like, I hate that. Yeah, the paralysis I that people- I could say that. that so easy and dismiss your argument That's right. by, I can't do everything right. Uh, mm. I guess, you know, like to me, that is the worst thing as a human being you can say to another person. Mm. So when I got to that elemental, I had to work through all of the, you know, anger, yeah. sorrow, yeah. all that stuff. I had to, you know, my 
go through all of it and, and remember like how hard my cast worked, how proud we were every day. Every day we cried on that set. The extras would come to us like we've never seen this before. You like, literally never seen this before. Uh, and then I had to come to that. Someone saying something. You're a storyteller. You have to listen. You're also an artist. So you made something. You can't change it. Yeah. Your ver your job is to make the thing and then the world takes it and does whatever they want with it. Yeah, let it go like a child. So, but me as a John Chu human being is are still is still going. Yeah. So and 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 if you're expecting other people to adjust their thinking and how they see the world or or put light on a blind spot they, they don't realize they have, then how do you want them to react? Mm. And I had to react in that way, even if it were like felt strange. These are these are conversations that have to be had and they are not, unfortunately, Twitter is the place to debate things and you can't nuance conversations can't and things that have so much history can't yeah. be told mm -hmm. in these little pockets. Yeah. Like you actually have to have a long conversation and talk about all the ins and outs of what has happened, where we are, what does this mean in that? Mm -hmm. Is this even part of it? Like all those things that go with it. And uh, so anyway, it's just, uh, it's what a, I, yeah, yeah. What I appreciate about it, no, when I saw it the first time, I was so thrilled to see all these brown people on screen. House. Saw it at Justin's yeah. house, like a screening before it had come out. Thanks to John. Oh my gosh, I'm like so thrilled, thrilled, thrilled. I love it, still love it. See it the second time, and I'm watching it with, with people who are black, Latinos, and there was some feeling of like, oh, I wasn't represented as much as I was, that I hoped. And then I was like, oh, okay. And then there was the feeling of not against the movie itself. This is what was being said. It's hard. We can't be seen in white movies. Oftentimes we're underrepresented. Now here's a film celebrating brown people and the black people in this community are up underrepresented. And so there was this feeling, but but at the same time, a conflict because, oh my God, so amazing. There's brown people on screen and directed by someone brown and all of this and written by someone brown. And um, so then it makes you feel like, where can I be seen? Where can I be championed? But what helped us through that was your guys' response. What you're saying now, what Lynn also had said, he just heard it and he validated it. And he had said, we made this amazing movie um, and in this regard, we fell short. Hopefully we'll do better next time. I love that. And what I hear you say too, is because if we can't do that, we can't like take the wheels off the car and not do it anymore. We have to get better, reflect, get better, reflect. And I think when people hear that response, we go, okay, cool. Got it. I love making movies. I love making fun movies that everybody gets to enjoy. I always call them like, we're, we're making a, a, a water slide. Like how fun we're making yeah. a water slide and we're showing you places that you haven't gone and all this stuff. And, and now, and I still like making a ride, but like now we're making runways. We're like doing the base basics so that other people can take off and go all their ways. And that's if that's and if we're I'm only there because we're the first mm. of this new turn page in Hollywood. Yeah. Then this all is a part of that. Mm. And we should as as our duty as storytellers, we should be able to do that and not get smashed. Mm from ourselves. It's actually not other people. The reality is other people think this much of me, whether they love your movie or hate your movie. They got their own shit. They got their own wheelbarrow they're carrying. They may have written something on Twitter that you has thought about all day, but guess what? <laughs> you ask them about your movie. They're like, wait, what would I watch? Oh yeah. Yeah. That thing. And you're, and for us, it's like, wait. And I had to like, also like, Oh yes, that's it. But like mm -hmm. all and, and all and like 10 of those things make it feel like the world, but like, mm -hmm. As a as a person, you've and and what we're trying to do and still achieve, mm. I had to keep walking, and that was uh, that was a process. If we're asking people to take down our history and our stories, and our fairy tales because they're seen from a perspective that is not what we see anymore, or there's more things that have not been put in there, then it is our responsibility to replace them with as much joy and wonder mm -hmm. and new stories from those other perspectives. If we don't replace them, we're giving people despair. Mm -hmm. the yes. We need these stories. Mm -hmm. So then, okay, who's up? Who's up? Who's who's here? Who can tell stories? And let's do as much as we can. Right. We need to flood the, we need to Netflix this shit. Yeah. Not yes. just 10 stories, not just yeah. 50 stories. 500,000 stories need to come out yeah. mm -hmm. that, have, that we've never seen before in the next however many years. And we have to commit to that because Otherwise, they won't. We won't take down the statues. Right. No. 
the and next before generation. Before you, you jump in, you, I, you know, I think it's such a good point. My, right. my friend Nitika uh, Chopra talks about, you know, we, we talk so much about cancel culture, but we need to talk about pedestal culture, mm. right? That your film was put on a pedestal, yeah. right? You're going to fix this problem of representation. And this film is going to change everything and it has to be perfect. And yeah, no film is perfect. And the more uh, we have, the less we can expect, you know, these, uh, I, I think, artists or these representation to, to sort of change everything. And I think it's so great also reverting back to masculinity, which is what this podcast is all about. I don't think I've ever heard like a male director like apologize. <laughs> like I think like it's just not a thing that we kind of tend uh-huh. to hear. And so I think even that um, and and obviously Lynn's response, um, those are new and 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 refreshing as as well. So I think the, you know, conflict or the controversy is important, but the response is important as well. Uh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I think it's all work in progress. We got to just keep going. Anyway, sorry, I cut you off. Um, no, no, no. I, I love, I love it. I, I, it's about time you cut me off. <laughs> the oh first few episodes was me cutting her off, uh, which I heard plenty about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and again, I, uh, again, you just try to, you listen to that feedback, and you're like, shit, I got to do better. Um, so speaking of that, so you walked us through how probably one of the most intense moments you probably are of your career in terms of that public feedback. Um, and how you, and how you navigated that? How do you navigate private personal feedback as a man? Like maybe in your marriage and in your friendships and relationships, um, do you kind of follow the same path? Shut up and listen. Is it a? Is a little bit of a fight? Like when that when your ego gets you know poked and you want to get defensive. E- yeah, I mean, I think communication is the number one thing. We are all separate beings and we're all in our own little universe in our brains. And the only way to connect is to connect. Mm -hmm. And if that's language, then so be it. But we've learned that language sometimes isn't enough. Okay. If that, if, if that's going somewhere so you can just like sit with each other to -hmm. get back on the same page, then so be it. Mm -hmm. Um, It also takes like dedicated time uh, reserved time to actually try to communicate. Um, so for me, it's, uh, and, 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 and by the way, it, I have, I had a lot of practice because of when you're making movies, you're constantly negotiating with people, yeah, negotiating with the studio of what they want, what you need, uh, with an actor, what they, what, what they're seeing and what you're trying to tell or what we're trying to tell together and how, what do they need to do that? And what do you need to do that, uh, with an editor? I, I think again, we're very privileged as storytellers that we get a lot of practice and if we do something and I've had, you know, uh, my success and failures of that, that I have made those moments, uh, almost like laboratories being, okay, if this time I'm just going to be chill and like let it slide and see if everything works out. Will that work? <laughs> sometimes it has, sometimes no, it doesn't. The same uh, thing. I, I've learned my bat when the when, but I've also learned a lot of when the battles aren't worth those those fights and like what I've come to the conclusion of we're not making the movie when we're shooting the movie. We're we're making the ingredients for a movie. We're picking the fruit and we're squeezing it as much as we can. If it doesn't get on that film, then we don't have it. So we gotta squeeze and get the best. And if it's not, I can't get the best out of you, what can get me? What can you give me that's the best? And how can I get that? And on the day, if I'm trying to do something, it's not working. If I don't get it, I don't have it. So what do we have? And where are we? And where's the time? Right? Like, how do we get the best of this moment right here? Mm. And when I get back to the edit room, I have all these little dishes of amazing things. And maybe it needs a little spice. Maybe it needs a little sugar. Maybe it needs, and we can rearrange. I can ruin everything if I wanted to in it. But now, because I know everybody's, where everybody wanted coming into this and what I wanted and where we all connect. I can try to do that in a movie and see if that works. And if it doesn't, we'll adjust accordingly. But mm. so for that, and then in my personal life, it's um, it's a little bit s- slow down yeah. a bit. Um, and I can't use the tricks that I use <laughs> with everybody else because those are temporary right. fixes sometimes. <laughs> Whereas with my wife and my kids, Your it's a like, longer- You're not the director of this ship. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Uh, she's like, I don't work for you. I'm like, oh yeah, no, yeah, no. She, um, that's a real thing. But she, I, I, she <laughs> is so the kindest person I've ever met. I always said as like, just as a thing. They're like, well, who are you gonna marry? I was like, I don't know. I, I want to marry the nicest person I ever meet. But she literally, I didn't think that was actually uh, true. That I could, she's literally the kindest person. She's so kind. She, is, there is a warmth glow. Mm-hmm. She, uh. She understands creative endeavors because she is creative, and yet she also values r- real life. 
um, and make sure that I remember what those real life things are. And uh, anyway, it's we it's I think it's just a lot. And it is dealing with it head on and not waiting anytime because I'm naturally passive aggressive and she's naturally passive aggressive. Mm. So two people who are very aware we're passive aggressive and don't want to be that way. Um, we have to sort of force each other to be like, OK, let's just like sit here and talk about whatever and forgive each other, have grace for each other during that. Because mm. we might say things that we actually don't mean because mm. words can fumble like, like that. So, mm. And we're getting, uh, I think we're getting close, but I, I want to ask you quick about imposter syndrome. Okay. Which is something that I have in spades. This, this feeling like uh, they're going to find out, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Um, and... And just, you know, you, you, you mentioned you kind of skipped, you skipped the music videos and the commercials and you went straight to studio movies mm -hmm. um, and then knocked it out of the park. It said you, you, it took you a lot of movies. You talked about, you know, six, seven movies to really find yourself. Do you, what advice do you have for people that like myself? Yeah, I was that, for Justin. For me. But, <laughs> but a lot of people have imposter syndrome. Yeah. A lot yeah. of people do. Of course. And I believe a lot of successful people do. Which is where the overcompetence of this, like, you know, masculinity, this, like, you know, that toxic stuff is really just insecurities mm -hmm. manifest and, and not being overconfident. And apologize deep down, and say sorry and all that. You know, mm -hmm. even defensiveness, even like the right. wrong ways to handle criticism is because you don't feel like you're enough already. Right. And you feel like you were caught. So you have to fight, you know, fight yeah. to the death. Yeah. So how do you handle imposter syndrome? Do you experience it? Have you had it? And then what advice do you have for me? Thank you, Jamie. Uh, or anybody, anybody else that, that has it. I, I don't know, by the way, I want you to answer. But w the reason why I love this question is, um, you know, the more you know Justin, as I know him for a long time. From the outside, it's like sometimes it's like, man, why do you, why do you second guess that? How can you second guess that? Like, look how good you are at this. Or you're so great at this. Or you care about this. And it sometimes can be confusing. Because I don't have this imposter syndrome. I just don't have it. Mm. I just assume I'm going to show up all the time and that I'm good. Right? <laughs> um, try to do that with humility, but I don't question it. So I love that you've asked this because his work is brilliant. But oftentimes he... Um, thinks he, it's he, shit. He thinks it's <laughs> shit. And then makes or everyone... That it's gonna, or that it's going to be shit. And then you work extra hard. And make other people around you work extra hard so it's not shit when in fact it wasn't shit. It's only because his eyes, you know, yeah. that imposter syndrome. So please, I'm sorry to interrupt you, the question, but I, mm -hmm. I second it. Please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, I mean, I, I assume that uh, a lot of artists, maybe most, I don't know. I don't know what the things are, have imposter syndrome, especially in a uh, industry that is about presentation mm -hmm. in a culture that is now first and foremost about presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I always think like imposter to who? Like who's making that judgment? Mm -hmm. um, I definitely feel to from other great filmmakers that imposter syndrome because I'm like, oh, I'm definitely not smarter than you. Taika, I'm definitely not smarter than you, who was Steven. And maybe I felt it more younger than I do now. I, I felt a turn. When Steven Spielberg finds your shorts, you bet you win the lottery. Yeah. But when you win the lottery, you don't know how to win again. Mm. Yeah. I had to figure out how to even make a movie. Like, I understand coverage, but not like movie coverage. Mm. I understood working with people, but I didn't know what a script supervisor does and how do I need to work with that person in order to better this process. I had edited all my stuff. So working with an editor was like, what? I don't get to control the things? That's crazy. So it took me every movie and I was lucky because each movie had its own little world to it. The pressure wasn't as high. So I got to make a lot of mistakes in those movies and mm -hmm. I did. Um, and it still was sort of considered okay because I because it kept making it made its fan base happy, and I learned how to deal with fan bases and the audience and stuff. Uh, once I had done all of that, I felt on like now you see me too working with these amazing actors from Mark Ruffalo to Woody Harrelson to uh, Morgan Freeman and uh, was like Michael Caine. I was like sitting there and we're making this franchise sequel, and I was like, oh, I can hang. Mm. they see me and I see them and we're doing this and I don't feel 
uh, unworthy of this. I felt like I hit my 10,000 hours at that moment. I was mm. like, oh, I know how to do this. Okay. As soon as I hit that, I felt a little empty. So I was like, wait, what am I doing here? And what, couldn't anyone else do this movie? Yeah, probably. And I love the movie, don't get me wrong. But I was like, well, shouldn't I be doing things that only I can do hmm. now? Because that not that what makes an, me as an artist? Like, what do I want to say now? And that's what brought me back to Guaylo. That's what brought me back to my college days when you had ideas of what you wanted to say and do and yeah. you get soul crushed or whatever you get adjusted to, to the world. Now I was sort of going back to that well and being like, oh yeah, I do care about those things. And now I know how to do it. And mm. now I know how the connections to make those things happen. That adjustment also helped me realize that I'm not begging you for a job. I am a, I'm an asset to be acquired. Mm. Mm. So if you, if so we are not going to make a good thing together, then great. I know that now and not two years from now when I'm and there's on somebody better. Set. There's somebody better for you. There's something better. Mm. So I, I, it's very easy for me to not get a job anymore. I'm like, oh, they didn't see me. Great. Let's go find someone that can I feel see like me. that's great dating advice. That's great. Probably. That's like everything <laughs> it advice. Is great. I feel like. I'm an asset to be acquired. I've, I yeah. want that like tattoo. Yeah, I want that everywhere. Like on a, if we had like the ability to have 3D screens, we just see throughout the day, like that just pop up like I'm 20 years from now. Yeah, so I remember that. Oh, that's a beautiful way to put it. Except for that, it makes confuses me a little bit because if a woman had that T-shirt. Okay, well, okay. yes, no, 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 I'm no, part, no, no. I'm saying <laughs> it's right. interesting that even in that, I even think about that stuff, yeah. which is why, like, oh, a woman says I'm an asset to be acquired. All of a sudden. That becomes a whole other thing. I yeah. have, I can say that, and it really have a lot of deep meaning. Um, well, to you, it could be a bunch of different things, and to her, it could mean something mm -hmm. totally different too. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that that's, I think when you realize that you are a thing, you accept yeah. that with all of it. Yeah, like come and get me. Yeah. It's like the difference of being yeah. empty or full. You're full, yeah. not full of yourself and that you think you're the shit, but you are full and you're not needing approval or validation or someone to hire you to fill you. Yeah. And that's, a, I think that's what an yeah. asset is. Yeah. It's, you're it's, complete. You're, yeah. yeah. You're, and it's like dating. It's like in a relationship. Anytime you go and you're trying to fill yourself with the other half, it never works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're too you're not full people. Yeah. You may not yeah. be your spice. That You may not yes. be ketchup and you want ketchup. Fine. But like, I know what I am. Yeah. Mm. And maybe that's also like growing, just growing up. Maybe yeah. that's not even about being an artist. It's just like yeah. coming to yourself that, that I am what I am. Mm -hmm. I'm going to learn what I learn. I can't be any better than this brain that literally can only take in so much, mm -hmm. can only process so much. And I have only certain experiences to, to A, B those decisions with. I'm only negotiating with a body that exists already that mm. I have only so much control over. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's like, all right. That's what I'm dealing with. I hopefully see people in a way. And again, that gets adjusted every time. Having yeah. kids was a totally different new way of seeing people. But isn't that beautiful? Yes. You just get to keep growing. And yes. And it doesn't matter if you, the other person doesn't see you for that. It's yeah. Like, we're, we live all in multi-planes now. Yes. Like, why can't we accept that that group can hate you and this group can love you? And we get to, like, hear both if we want or we get to go and then... But we have to, you know, we're all coming, we're, we're all coming together now. Or like Steven can be smarter than you and it doesn't mean you're not enough. It doesn't mean you're not great at what you do. hundred percent. As I tell myself that as I sit next to the master, John Chu. <laughs> uh, all right, rapid fire questions. Shall oh, we? Okay. Welcome to this week's Man Enough podcast, rapid fire questions. What are you afraid of? What am I afraid of? Okay, these are that's okay. Uh, okay, what am I afraid of? We have very light rapid fire questions here. <laughs> yeah. We like to keep it light. Um, I am afraid of a of drowning. Hmm. Oh wow. I'm scared of a painful death. Mm. Dying or weird? is it just no, not a dying. painful death? I'm I'm okay with dying. Like, let's wow. go, whatever. Mm. Uh I'm okay with Realizing that I'm dying and then being like, this sucks. I didn't want it to be like this. <laughs> I can't. I think because I have a lot of dreams of that. And I'm just like, oh, wow. I hate that feeling. Mm. Like, I can't do anything about this. Yeah. Well, I guess it's my last moment and it really hurts. All right, whatever. So yeah. many, And a lot of those dreams come from us feeling like we're drowning in life. It could be. Yeah. Can I tell you, drown? because I have drowning dreams and I have a lot of dreams. And I think a lot about dreams. Dreaming about drowning is actually symbolic of a rebirth. 
So if you have a lot of dreams about drowning, it might mean that you have a lot of rebirths in your life. Mm. And I hope that's coming. I hope it's coming. Right. I mean, I, I think you, three. it's coming. <laughs> no, it's, it's, definitely, just based on this it's definitely coming. Yeah. I, mean, I have a question. Do yeah. we understand what rapid fire questions okay, are? Sorry, sorry. It, it means ask a question and then do uh, we answer okay, real quick? Okay, okay, one more. Justin. And also this man, real quick. This man makes two-hour cinematic experiences for the world. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to rush him. When was the last time you cried? Uh... This uh, on on Sunday. What day is it? Yeah, yesterday. Oh wow. Yeah. Oh, what about what about? Yeah. I'm doing auditions for Wicked right now, and those songs are brutal. Those songs are like mm -hmm. oh, they just raw. wreck you. They seem like they're in some big, fun musical, but when you hear those words mm. about seeing like for good, for good goodbye, wrecks me. Saying goodbye to a friend that that is a part of your life mm. and that they're not gone from your life, they're just gone, mm. and that's like. Seeing each other for love, that's hard. It's really hard. Mm. And even Defying Gravity, watching oh. these people sing Defying Gravity, everybody has their own, brings their own baggage to this song. And it is because it's the moment where Alphaba realizes that all the stories she's been told are lies, that the system that she's been asked to to become a part of, and that she's so different from it, that she has to control her power. She has to be this, smile more, act like this, do that, that in the end, it's all a facade and it, the system was never made for her to ever get anywhere it was a mm. treadmill and now she's gonna burn the whole shit down yes and she's gonna fly like watching a character go through that in a song is very emotional in these times especially mm. so you're you're straight up casting you're auditioning yeah i'm not sure what i'm allowed to say but yes we're, we're wow. let me say that we're yeah we're auditioning let me say that's that. ex that's really cool Mm. You are uh, directing all my favorite you. musicals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, I got one. Tell me uh, five things you love about your culture. Um, I love the food. I love the family first aspect to it. I know that this is all shared in other cultures too, but I love that. I love uh, that you don't have to say I love you to know that they love you. Mm. That when we put our minds to something, we will do it. Like you know, we'll show up, and it, there's nothing extra about why we're there. Like hmm. they'll show up for you. What I love right now is this is this identity of the Asian American forming. The Asian American has really never been defined by Asian Americans because the generations just weren't gathered enough. And now we're at the spot that we're making the stories, we're deciding how we want to be seen, we're deciding uh, how our music wants to be, we're deciding why we fit into America, and we're deciding how to fit in Asia. And I think that's like so inspiring every day because new people are coming up with new things all the time. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even think of that. I've thought about this a lot. So that's been really fun. Well, I just will say to you, I asked that because coming from a culture myself that oftentimes is undervalued. Mm. I, I don't know if I've ever said that out loud or even thought mm. of it, to be honest. Exactly. And I wanted to hear because I second all those things that I see in your culture. And I'm sorry that you, your culture so oftentimes in our country is um, dismissed mm. for the oppression that you experience mm. because there are um, bigger ones like the African-American experience. So oftentimes it comes second and third fourth um mm. when it's not second and third and fourth. Mm. it's equal to um for different reasons yeah so um i understand I what that. that's about and i just wanted to hear you say it out loud so that i could hear it and then other people can hear it and uh thanks for being here brother. no thank Share you that. that means a lot appreciate that. all right when is the last time that you apologized not on this podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was about to say, but... <laughs> last time i apologized uh well last night with my son because he was crying every hour. And so eventually we were like, you can't, uh, we're not gonna pick you up. We're just gonna like, you can stay in your crib and I'm just gonna talk to you and rub your back. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's hard to do. So mm -hmm. I apologized to him while it was happening. I was like, I'm so sorry, but this will be good. Just mm -hmm. hug your lovey. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, Love so you get hard. scared, hug your blank, whatever it is. So that was hard. All right, here we go. Time yes. machine. You get to go back to seven, eight-year-old John. Yeah. What do you whisper in his ear? Keep going. I think that's what you need every day 
and he'll need that every day. Mm. He'll have a lot of questions. He'll miss his mom a lot, mm. sleeping over people's houses. He'll be embarrassed about it, but it'll be deep inside him. And in every situation, he has to keep going. Now you have a time machine and you get to go and be a guest at your own funeral. And your three children are talking about your life. Just three? <laughs> you, never Four, know. you never know, you never know. Five, <laughs> all of your children. Yes, okay, all of that's makes sense. Are talking about your life. Uh, what do you hope they say about you and the way you move through the world? Hmm. From my, my children? Yeah, yeah. He prepared us. Mm. That he was a, that he uh, loved us so deeply that he gave us the tools to cope. Mm. I love that. I would be proud if they, no matter what was thrown at them, including my death, that they had tools to use to get through that. Mm. Uh, because I'm not sure everybody gets that. Oh. Or they have to learn different ways. Mm. So. Final question, Liz, you want? What does it mean for you to be man enough? What does it mean to be man enough for me? <laughs> I don't know. I'm questioning every gender-specific idea at this point. I'm questioning what is it? Why do we even have it? But for me, as, you know, growing up, I guess, up to this point-ish, uh, it means uh, taking care of your world. It means caring, giving, being able to balance and uplift mm. the people around you. Mm. At least that's how I think of... I actually think your first man. instinct was also the right mm -hmm. answer. Questioning every gender specific idea. Mm -hmm. Well, John, you, if anybody is, are man enough. <laughs> and nice. I so appreciate you coming on. And I just want to say, personally, I was going through a really dark time creatively. And I told you this, but I'm going to say this for everybody. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to make movies anymore. Mm. And yet I had started the studio. <laughs> and I have all this. And I just wasn't sure if I had it creatively. I was just in a rut after the book and just not sure if it was for me and I wanted to be with my kids. And then I saw In the Heights mm. and it lit a fire in me, brother. And they say, you know, one candle can light thousands. And I appreciate you relighting mine with your creativity. Thank you, brother. Meant the that world means a lot. To me. That means a lot. Thank you for being that. here, man. Thanks. We need you. We need all of you guys. All hands on deck. Yes. Uh, we'll be right back. This is Man Enough. Welcome back to Man Enough. I am Liz Plank. I'm Jamie Heath. And, and where's Justin? I think he is still talking to Listen, John. Listen, this is the coolest thing. Justin's yeah. not going to recap with us. Yeah. He's, because he's geeking out right he now is. with John. He's, so we don't want to ruin his moment. I'm going to take his seat. Do it. You and I can be next to each yes. other. We don't need Justin. We don't need Justin. Forget that dude. Yeah. yeah. Come on over here. Oh my God. I love it. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm in Justin's spot. <laughs> what did you think? Oh my goodness. Um... I want to know what you think more than what I care about what I think. Okay. Tell me what you think about what we just did. Uh, I loved this conversation so much that I took notes. I actually was like, is it weird that I'm just taking notes? Not because I'm, you know, mm. going to ask a question about it, but so that I remember it. Right. Um, I took so many notes like that to make failures a laboratory, I'm trying to understand and then mm. get better. Um, when he said we were talking about imposter syndrome and he said, imposter to who? Mm. Again, it's like, wh who am I trying to prove anything to? Mm. Um, and and uh, obviously, I'm not an asset to be acquired. Um, right. No, sorry. I'm I not am. begging for a job. I'm an asset to be acquired. So <laughs> my asset. handwriting is difficult because we don't write anything anymore. What I love, too, is that when he talked about the imposter syndrome, and since we know that Justin, who is... I say this in front of him all the mm -hmm. time, but behind closed doors, mm -hmm. he is really a, a special human. And um, and he does struggle with that yep. imposter syndrome. So I love that John was here, if for no other reason, to like help him just get that monkey off yeah. his back. 
Um, I also love that he was willing to talk about In the Heights. Mm-hmm. And go uh, deep. And go deep and and talk about his, how much he still wants to move forward and keep going and how important that is. Mm-hmm. But also to recognize like where some of the blind spots are. Yeah. Right. And how and, and to reflect really is what we have to do. So yeah. I appreciated that because I was prepared to come at him and come at him. Mm-hmm. I was I was prepared to come in and be like, hey, man, why didn't you have. Yeah. Have you been to Washington Heights? You know that there are more people that look like. Mm-hmm. And I didn't. He just diffused all that. Yeah. That's what's amazing. Yeah. about Being man enough to mm-hmm. be able to apologize and come clean and. um you don't have to like posture anymore. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And you know what? I felt a little nervous when during the rapid fire question, when you said, uh, tell me five things you like about, about your, your culture. I was like, oh man, is he going to feel like we're making this whole thing about the fact that he's Asian? Like I actually was very, I had so many more questions planned about mm. Asian women. We we didn't even really talk about, you know, mm. all the violence against the Asian community. But I was like, mm. we, this is, we can't pigeonhole. Like he's so many other things. Yes. And actually, if all of our questions are about that, we're, it's a disservice to and they weren't ma- amazing. They weren't. So anyway, I, but I, all this to say, he loved your question. And then that was mm. a beautiful moment. And so mm. um, I was really, really happy um, to, to, to get to witness that. I'm nervous every time you ask me a question. Oh my God, same. You know what? <clears throat> We yeah. have to wrap up. We know this was really sweet to do this, but I think the best part about this recap is Justin's not here. <laughs> His hair is not I feel here. Like it's the best recap ever. I can't tell. I can't put my I finger. I think we should why. kick Justin's um, just straight off. Mm-hmm. I don't think that works. Actually, okay, we can do that next. We, um, well, work. this was great. Um, Justin, we miss you. We, we love mi- you. We come do. Back, we miss back, you. We love back, you. Yes. Back. Um, hey, if you like what you heard and you're interested in having more conversations like this, uh, Liz, where do they find us? They go to minenough.com slash podcast. That's right. And you go on all the places you get your podcasts, such mm-hmm. as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, mm-hmm. The Lemon, Apple, Pineapple. There's a fruit one. Pineapple. I always forget the fruit. I think it's pineapple. It's a pineapple. Follow us there. Studio. We can, you can, you can, okay. And subscribe and like and all those things. Yeah, that it's you're supposed free. To do. It's free. You can watch on YouTube. Did you, you say that? You can watch on YouTube if you right. want to see. You can see Liz and the... her beautiful, mm-hmm. wonderful green yes. top. Sure. Yeah. Um, listen, guys uh, and 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 ladies and everyone, uh, we appreciate you being here, and um, we'll see you next time. Please subscribe. I am Jamie Heath. I am Liz Plank. And I am Justin Baldoni. <laughs> It's a great impression. (laughs) We'll see you next time. This is Man Enough.